War has been a theme of art for millennia because it reflects some of the most emotionally charged moments of human history. Artists choose the subject of war for a variety of reasons. Some choose it to educate about the realities of conflict or to inspire through the depiction of heroism. Some seek to record the tragedy of death, the sorrow of defeat, and joy of victory. And some try to encourage support or to shock viewers into opposition. Artworks about historical events can be rich sources of information, including details of what types of armor was worn or what weapons were used in particular battles, but artists can be biased, manipulating scenes to promote a specific point of view or message, so art about war should be assessed and considered carefully. Artists have often recorded and celebrated the bravery and power of warriors, both in their successes and defeats, in great detail. The palette of Normer is one of the earliest surviving ancient Egyptian artworks that records the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt after a great war and highlights the importance of the first pharaoh, Narmer, who ruled and kept the peace. This artwork could have very easily been included in the Art and Political Leaders and Rulers lecture, but I'm including it here because it focuses on military strength and references war specifically. Um, before the reign of Narmer, Egypt was divided into Upper Egypt to the south and Lower Egypt, named so because the flow of the Nile towards the more fertile north. Palettes such as this one were used to grind pigment that both men and women painted around their eyes to protect them from the sun. The round area on the front of the palette of Narmer, in which the necks of two creatures intertwine, would have been the area that was used for mixing that paint. Um, the front of the palette is divided into four registers, or horizontal sections. The top register shows a pair of horned bull heads, which represents the aggressive strength of the king. In the next register, the king is shown larger than the other figures in order to indicate his importance, which we know as hierarchical scale. On the far right of this register, we see ten bodies with severed heads placed between their legs, indicating the scores of enemies that Narmer has defeated. The intertwining of the fantastical long-necked creatures in the next register embodies that unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. In the bottom register, Narmer is again shown as a bull. Um, this time, he bows his head towards a fortified city and tramples over an enemy. The back of the palette features a large scene in which the pharaoh, wearing the white crown that symbolizes Upper Egypt, prepares to club an enemy who kneels before him. The falcon behind him represents the god Horus, suggesting that Narmer was supported by the gods. Um, at the very bottom of this scene, we see two fallen enemies um, viewed sort of as if we're looking at them from above. And much of the hieroglyphic writing on this palette has yet to be interpreted. However, it seems to record the names of places conquered by Narmer. As a whole, the palette shows this pharaoh's military might as he unifies all of Egypt under his rule. The Edo Kingdom of Benin in present-day southern Nigeria was at its height between 1450 and 1700. The king, or Oba, lived with his court in a palace in the capital city. Benin Obas commissioned hundreds of brass artworks to reflect their power, including at least 900 plaques like this one that originally decorated the royal palace. These plaques depicted Obas, royal family members, soldiers, and dignitaries. This particular plaque depicts a central warrior flanked by several smaller attendants. He is in higher relief than the others, making him seem closer to us, and his larger size is meant to signify his importance. The ceremonial sword he carries in his left hand and his elaborate helmet tell us that he is a high-ranking chief. His spear and the shields of those beside him are imposing, emphasizing their physical power and that of their ruler, the Oba. The chief wears a leopard tooth necklace and has dotted markings on his stomach and arms that resemble the spots of a leopard. Leopards, known for their power and speed, were a symbol of the Oba. In 1897, British soldiers attacked, burned, and looted the city of Benin and the royal palace in what is now called the British Punitive Expedition. 
They removed thousands of artworks, um, which you can kind of see some photographs of those here on this slide. On the right, British colonial officers are posing with piles of bronze plaques like the one on the previous slide, which were taken from the columns of the Oba's palace. The looted objects were shipped back to Britain as spoils of war and symbols of victory. Many of them went to the British Museum, but others were sold, ending up in collections around the world. In recent decades, the Kingdom of Benin, now part of the nation of Nigeria, has requested the return of the looted objects, arguing that they belong to the kingdom and the current Oba. At this point, several museums, including the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, are in the process of returning the objects that they have to the newly built museum in Benin City, which opened just last year. I believe the British Museum is still in negotiations with the Benin Kingdom after initially denying their request for repatriation. When art is looted, censored, or even destroyed during times of war, it highlights the importance of art to society. Iconoclasm is the destruction of images or artworks, often out of religious belief, and it is unfortunately pretty commonly associated with war. For example, Islamic belief objects to making representational imagery because it usurps the creative power of Allah and because images can lead to idolatry or the worship of the images themselves. Generally, Muslims avoid representational imagery in religious contexts such as in the Quran or in mosques, but fundamentalist regimes have often interpreted those beliefs more strictly, using them to forbid all representational imagery, no matter the context, but especially when the images represent religious or spiritual things. In 2001, fundamentalist rulers known as the Taliban declared that all statues in the country of Afghanistan were to be destroyed because they were being worshipped and venerated by unbelievers. The order targeted statues large and small in both museums and private spaces, as well as other public areas. The statues that caught the public's attention the most were a pair of monumental Buddhas in Bamiyan carved directly into the living rock of a cliff face sometime between the third and seventh centuries. These Buddhas were originally cared for by monks and visited by pilgrims during religious festivals. The monks and pilgrims left centuries before, but the statues survived. And at the time it seemed scarcely credible that they were about to be blown up, but that is exactly what happened. In early March 2001, despite international diplomatic efforts, the sculptures were destroyed by the Taliban using explosives. Similarly, in 2015, the terrorist group ISIL or ISIS recorded themselves toppling and destroying ancient Assyrian relief sculptures made for King Ashurnasirpal II in Nimrud, which is in present day northern Iraq. The group claimed this iconoclasm was to prevent the false worship of idols, um, or the worship of false idols, I suppose. However, many people argued that these objects no longer held a spiritual significance, but are instead now treasures of cultural heritage. And the same could be said of the Baimiyan Buddhas. The fact that in both instances the destruction was announced and carried out publicly, either dramatically with explosives or recorded and posted online, implies the actions had more to do with conveying a sense of power and instilling fear and devastation in others. Some artists have focused on the heat of battle, conveying the sights, sounds, and sensations of war. These artworks can be valuable records of history, providing a series of events and accurate details of the weapons and uniforms used by those involved. The 275 foot long Bayou Tapestry records the events surrounding the Battle of Hastings in 1066, in which the Normans, led by William the Conqueror, seized control of England from the Anglo-Saxons. This tapestry was probably commissioned by William's brother Odo, the Bishop of Bayeux in France, shortly after the Norman victory. The so-called tapestry is actually an embroidery that was worked by women. In fact, it's said that William's wife was one of the embroiderers, and it took more than 10 years to complete. It shows the events that lead to the Battle of Hastings, the preparations of the Norman fleet, the battle itself, and finally the coronation of William the Conqueror as King of England. 
More than 600 men, but only three women are shown in the 50 scenes of the tapestry. In this detail of the Battle of Hastings, we can see um, some nice examples of the patterned armor and conical helmets of the soldiers and the weapons that they carry, including broadswords, shields, and spears. The embroiderers who worked on this were very highly skilled. To establish a sense of depth, each figure is given a border, which is filled in with stitches running in the opposite direction to the rest of the embroidery, and then outlined in boldly contrasting colors. The process creates clearly delineated figures, a flat sense of space to guide the viewer in a horizontal direction, and through repeated patterns, an overall sense of rhythm. The Hiyaji Monogatari is one of several long Japanese painted narrative hand scrolls from the late 13th century that details the events of the Hiyaji Rebellion of 1159 and 60. During this period, several rival clans fought for control of Kyoto, the historical capital of Japan. The scroll is representative of the visual style of its period. Almost 23 feet long in total, it employs isometric perspective from a bird's eye view. The horses and warriors are carefully delineated and detailed. The precise lines and limited use of blurry brushwork, as in the horse's tails and the billowing smoke, demonstrate the artist's skill. The story in the scroll is read from right to left, and the artist guides the viewer in that direction using the diagonal lines of the buildings, the layering of the figures, and the movement of the billowing smoke. In this detailed section here, titled Night Attack on the Sanjo Palace, um, we see a scene in which the palace is burned by samurai warriors of the Fujiwara and Minamoto clans during a raid in which they captured the Emperor Niho. Soon after, another clan, the Terra clan, rescued the emperor and regained control of Kyoto. Um, the building on the right shows the palace under attack. Then moving left, prisoners are beheaded. The emperor is shown captured on a black cart in the lower left, and then later in the scroll, the emperor is shown imprisoned with the decapitated heads displayed on pikes. Um, the attention to detail here is um, able to give us a strong sense of the equipment and weapons that were used in this kind of event. Um, the Japanese samurai are shown covered in intricately detailed armor atop their fine and powerful horses. Lengthy bows and arching swords are their weapons of choice. Artists also often create works that attempt to convey their personal experiences of war. This can be a cathartic exercise releasing emotion, and it can be meant to inspire awareness of the realities of war. But by no means have all powerful responses to war been created by artists who actually witnessed the events they portray. Artists can produce powerful visual statements about the horrors of war from both their personal experience and their own imaginations. Francisco Goya's set of paintings, the 2nd and the 3rd of May, 1808, are considered some of the most powerful portrayals of the horrors of war. The Spanish War of Independence between 1808 and 1814 was known for its guerrilla fighting and for the heroism of the civilian population. The 2nd of May depicts a bloody uprising in Madrid um, against the French Emperor Napoleon's troops who were occupying the city in 1808. The 3rd of May documents those French troops executing Spanish citizens. The paintings were commissioned in 1813 by the Spanish king to memorialize the event. Goya, a Spanish citizen who lived through this Napoleonic occupation, had very complex views about the political situation as he watched it unfold. But in these works, he made choices about how the images needed to be organized to evoke the drama and brutality of the event. Now, we've already discussed the 3rd of May um, previously in the semester but it is the more um, well-known, the more popular of the two paintings. Um, and that central figure is given the most emphasis, standing with his arms held high in his bright white shirt that glows from the light of the singular lamp. He is about to be executed, which is suggested by the repetition of his pose in the dead figure lying bloodied on the ground. Terror is on the faces that surround this martyr, making him seem calm in comparison. 
Goya continually brings our attention back to this figure by using directional lines, such as the strong horizontals created by the rifles. The viewer identifies with the victims, not the line of faceless executioners. In his Disasters of War series, Goya documented the horrors of the Spanish War of Independence, also known as the Peninsular War of 1808 to 1814 between Spain and France, one of the bloodiest events in Spain's modern history, with some 215 to 375,000 Spanish military personnel and civilians dying during the war. The series consists of about 82 aquatent etchings exploring the effects of war, including carnage, conflict, famine, heroism, and retribution. On the top left of the slide, um, we have gloomy premonitions of what must come to pass. This was intended as the frontispiece or the first image in the series, and it serves as a warning of sorts to viewers. The sky is dark and war is imminent as a man kneels alone within these menacing shadows. The light reveals his haggard body and his ragged torn clothing and his expression of deep distress and anxiety about the events to come as he pleads for help, powerless in the face of inevitable war. To the top right in the print titled, And There's Nothing to Be Done, a blindfolded man is bound to a wooden pole with his head down. His clothing is tattered, but still bright white in saturation, kind of indicating that though he may be defeated, he is still a hero. In front of him, a twisted corpse lays on the ground with bloody eyes, brain matter sort of oozing out. Likely this man was just alive moments ago. And other men are bound behind that central man with a line of men with rifles aiming at them. This kind of pulls our eye over to the barrels that you know, we don't see full guns or, or the riflemen, but we do see the barrels of the guns that point at the central man, kind of indicating that the hero is about to die. There are executioners everywhere, and as the title or the caption says, there is nothing to be done. Um, some of the plates in this series include titles such as Yolo V or I Saw This, um, on the lower left here, which indicate that Goya did witness some of these conflicts firsthand. Um, in this case, terrified citizens are running to escape an unseen violence. Um, lastly, on the lower right, in Great Deeds Against the Dead, which is one of the most extreme prints of the series, we see naked, mutilated bodies of Spanish men who have been captured by the French, um, and then they were tortured and hung from a tree as a warning. Um, so these are quite dark, but they really show how Goya was truly one of the first artists to reveal the grim reality of warfare, stripped of all chivalry, romance, and idealized notions. German painter Otto Dix served in World War I and employed symbolism in his triptych, The War, to record the horrors that he witnessed. The central panel shows death and destruction. A soldier wearing a gas mask representing Dix himself witnesses the devastation firsthand. Bloody bodies are piled on top of one another, one with legs in the air. Chaos fills the scene. Arched pieces of metal stretch across the sky and support a skeletal figure whose outstretched finger points towards the bullet-ridden body on the right. The arching forms enclose the scene, leaving us feeling smothered by the horror that is shown. Our anxiety is increased with nothing to calm us or to rest our eyes upon. The left wing of the triptych shows heavily equipped soldiers united in their duty and prepared for battle. The scene precedes the horror that will take place in the central panel. The right hand wing shows a man, again a self-portrait of Dix, carrying a wounded soldier. The sky in the triptych here symbolizes the increasing danger of the situation, beginning on the left with pale sunlight, moving toward foreboding clouds, and ending with a stormy and destructive sky on the right. Underneath the central panel in the bottom section called the Perdea, Dix has painted a sleeping or dead soldier lying in a trench. The triptych format is traditionally used for religious scenes, with Christ's crucifixion portrayed in the center and his entombment in the Perdea below. By using this format, Dix elevates the importance of his subject matter, and in associating an ordinary soldier with the soon-to-be-resurrected Christ, he endows him with the status of a martyr. 
Dix also created a series of prints that record the horrors he experienced during the war. Um, the series dates to 1923 and 24 and is widely regarded as one of the 20th century's most powerful artistic statements on war and the artist's greatest graphic work. The images here are based largely on the artist's own memories, creating unflinching accounts of the horrors and the perversity of war. Um, Dix referred to photographs of the deceased and of disfigured bodies and corpses. He also studied um, corpses that were in the morgue, and he turned to Goya's Disasters of War series for inspiration as well. Throughout the series, Dix demonstrates a commanding use of print techniques with etching, dry point, and aquatint, exploiting the corrosive nature of etching and aquatint to heighten the sense of decay in his images, which picture the aftermath of battle, dead, dying, and decomposing corpses, shell-shocked soldiers, bombed-out landscapes, etc. Many soldiers who have been traumatized by battle and the atrocities they have seen convey a seemingly wide-eyed, faraway gaze that is often called the thousand-yard stare. This condition was captured by the artist Thomas Lee in a painting that was reproduced in Life magazine in 1945, bringing widespread awareness to the American public of the shock and trauma experienced by soldiers. The Texan artist turned World War II war correspondent witnessed this soldier at the Battle of Peleliu, which was fought between Japan and the United States in 1944. Lee described the man, whose name is not known, as having been fighting for two years under constant emotional stress caused by experiencing illness, violence, and extreme lack of sleep, as well as witnessing the death of the majority of his comrades. Appreciation of the psychological effects of war on humans is generally a modern phenomenon, while earlier depictions of war typically focus on the physical injuries experienced by warriors instead. Spanish artist Pablo Picasso painted Guernica as a passionate response to the aerial attack carried out on April 26, 1937, on the small town in northern Spain known as Guernica. During the Spanish Civil War, the nationalist general Francisco Franco, who would later become the country's ruler, allowed German and Italian planes to test their bombing tactics on Guernica and study the psychological effects of air warfare. News of the attack quickly spread to Paris, where Picasso read stories and saw photographs of the devastation in newspapers. The absence of color and the small dashes on the body of the horse in his composition recall the black and white newspaper photographs. While the general meaning of Guernica is clearly outrage against the violence directed at the citizens of the small Spanish town, Picasso never explained the specific symbolism of the figures in the painting. He stated, a picture is not thought out and settled beforehand. While it is being done, it changes as one's thoughts change. And when it is finished, it still goes on changing according to the state of mind of whoever is looking at it. Um, we see expressive faces with distorted necks scream and cry in despair. And on the right, a figure reaches to the sky as it escapes from a burning building. Flames appear like scales on the back of a dragon. The tortured figure on the left experiences the horror of her child's murder. The bull is often associated with the violence of Spanish bullfighting and typically is seen by many as being a symbol of Franco. The terrified horse, as it tramples upon a man lying on the ground, may represent the chaos inflicted on the people by the attack. The light bulb shining powerfully at the top of the canvas may symbolize awareness and knowledge, as if illuminating the situation. Picasso exhibited this large protest statement at the Spanish Pavilion during the 1937 World's Fair in Paris, France, and declared that neither he nor the painting would go to Spain as long as Franco ruled. The artwork traveled the world before residing in New York's Museum of Modern Art. Franco died in 1975, two years after Picasso. And in 1981, Guernica was finally sent to Madrid, Spain to be exhibited there permanently. In June 1972, Vietnamese photographer Nick Oot captured an image of children running from their village in Vietnam after a napalm attack. 
His image was so shocking that some, including the U.S. President Richard Nixon, questioned its authenticity when it appeared in newspapers. The image also moved many Americans to question their nation's involvement in the Vietnam War. The photographer defended the authenticity of the image for years, saying, quote, The picture for me and unquestionably for many others could not have been more real. The photo was as authentic as the Vietnam War itself. The horror of the Vietnam War recorded by me did not have to be fixed. That terrified little girl is still alive today and has become an eloquent testimony to the authenticity of that photo. Although the photograph records an actual event, Oot's disapproval of the war and his concern for its victims influenced the way his shot was composed. He focused on the young girl named Kim Fook, who is screaming in terror and running naked, her clothes having been burned off her body. Her two brothers are running on the left side of the image, while her two cousins hold hands behind her on the right. The soldiers in the background appear strangely calm, a dramatic contrast to the horrified expressions of the running children. The story of the people in the photograph did not end with this moment, however. The nine-year-old girl kept screaming. The photographer gave her his water and rushed her to a hospital. Physicians predicted that the little girl would die, but because of the photograph's fame, money poured in to save her. She underwent 17 surgical operations and later immigrated to Canada. Nick Oot became her Uncle Nick, and the two have remained close in contact throughout their lives. Um, Kim Fook was embarrassed for many years by the photo and her notoriety, but as an adult, she created her own foundation that assists children who are victims of war. The German artist Anselm Kiefer was born just months before World War II ended and grew up in a society ashamed of its past. His artworks urge viewers to acknowledge the horrors of the Nazi regime that ruled Germany from 1933 to 1945. Kiefer's breaking of the vessels conveys the loss of life and the destruction of knowledge caused by the extermination of millions of Jews during the Holocaust. The imposing 27-foot-tall artwork is made of lead and glass. The heavy lead books appear to be scorched, just as so many human beings, also holders of knowledge, were incinerated in concentration camps. The shattered glass also recalls Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when the Nazis destroyed hundreds of Jewish stores and synagogues in 1938. The splintered glass on the ground makes any access to these books of knowledge a dangerous and frightening proposition. Symbolically, Kiefer has conveyed the fear and pain one must face in order to confront the past. In this work, Kiefer draws upon the Jewish religion and more specifically, the Kabbalah, a collection of Jewish mystical writings. The words and sof, which mean the infinite presence of God, are written on the arched piece of glass above the bookshelf. Ten lead labels are placed around and on the bookshelf. These represent the ten vessels that, as described in the Kabbalah, are believed to contain the essence of God. In this way, the books represent the potential presence of God even in the midst of destruction and tragedy. The Egyptian street artist Mohamed Fami, known as Ganzir, became internationally famous for his graffiti art criticizing the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, a council of military officials that ruled his country after the Egyptian Revolution in February 2011. Immediately following the revolution, Ganzir began a series called the Martyr Murals, in which he created portraits of those killed during the revolution. During Mad Graffiti Weekend, which was May 20th and 21st in 2011, Gunzir produced his best known work, Tank vs. Bread Biker, in which an enormous tank points its gun at a young Egyptian boy on a push bike who is balancing a huge tray full of bread on his head. Gunzir was assisted by a team of volunteers to create the stencils for this work. Later, the artist known as Sad Panda added his trademark figure of a panda behind the boy. And since then, other artists have added to the image and it continues to evolve. For example, the artist Khalid painted bodies being crushed under the tank, recording an actual event that took place in October 2011, when a group of peaceful civilians protesting the demolition of a church were attacked by security forces in the army. Graffiti and other street art was a major form of protest throughout the uprisings against governments across West Asia and North Africa in the early 2010s.
Wafa Bilal was born in Iraq in 1966. As a young artist, he was arrested for making art critical of the dictator Saddam Hussein and his political party. In 1991, he fled Iraq rather than participate in the invasion of Kuwait. After living in a refugee camp, Bilal eventually settled in the United States, where he completed art school and started a career as a professor in New York City. When Bilal left Iraq, his family stayed behind. His brother was killed in 2004 by bombs that were dropped by the American Armed Forces. This work, Domestic Tension, which is also known as Shoot an Iraqi, was Bilal's response to this event and the U.S. war against Iraq. Inspired by a news story about American drone pilots stationed in the United States while their drones flew in Iraq, the artist linked a paintball gun to the internet. He placed the gun in a Chicago art gallery and then occupied that space for the next month. People visiting the corresponding website controlled the gun. They tracked and shot at him over 65,000 times. Unlike the make-believe action that takes place in most online games, moving a mouse or clicking a button in domestic tension had a very real consequence. The project crossed the line between the virtual and real worlds, raising questions about identity, violence, and warfare. The artist states, I wanted to create a virtual and physical platform, turning the virtual to physical and vice versa by putting my body on the line, create a physical impact in viewers by enabling them to identify with the physical effect on my body. I never anticipated how many people would be drawn to the project and how it would become a truly dynamic artwork in which the viewers had control over the narrative. It achieved an unexpected goal of democratizing the process of viewing and the making of the artwork by enabling the audience to participate. As evidenced by dialogue on the website's chat room, the experience had a profound impact on many people from all sides of the political spectrum. At the conclusion of the project, I felt fulfilled in my mantra that today we silenced one gun, hopefully one day we will silence all guns. Art can serve as a way of acknowledging historical tragedy, mistreatment, or suffering, often in the hope that similar events will not be repeated. Memorials may address the history of a single individual or of many people, and while often designed to promote healing and hope, they can also cause controversy or inflame unresolved issues in society. The Osmot people live on the island of New Guinea in the southern Pacific Ocean. Sculpted mangrove trees known as beast poles that are 12 to 30 feet high are made to care for and honor the souls of those who have died, especially warriors. When bark is ritually removed from the trunk of the tree, the red sap on the white wood symbolizes the blood that has been lost. The carvings depict stacked human figures, sometimes groups of deceased people and sometimes one deceased person along with their ancestors. The lower part of the sculpture called the canoe is believed to carry the deceased into the afterlife. The projection at the top is actually the root of the tree, which is turned upside down before carving and which is also a phallic symbol of fertility. In the past, when a community member died, it was believed that an enemy's head needed to be captured and hung on the pole to avenge that person's death and therefore bring order and balance back to society. While headhunting ended in the mid-20th century, beast poles are still used today as monuments to the dead and in healing rituals. Once a beast pole has served its ritual function, it is placed in sago palm groves to decay and nourish future harvests of the trees, which are an important food source for the Ozma people. This final step in the ritual shows the Osmot belief in a connection between fertilization of the land and memorialization of the ancestors. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial was built in Washington, D.C. to pay tribute to many fallen men and women in the hope of laying rest to some of the lingering controversy over the war. The design itself was, however, immediately controversial. Artist Maya Lin was only 20 years old when she won the competition to design the memorial. She envisioned her monument as a place for mourning and healing. A black granite V-shaped wall descends into the earth and then ascends, giving one a sense of coming into the light. The wall also becomes taller as one descends, creating a powerful visual expression for the enormous loss of life during the war. 
It symbolizes the eternal wound in America caused by the conflict, but also the healing that Lynn hoped would take place as those who experienced the monument walked through it and physically rose again. The names of the dead are carved into the wall and organized by the date of death. The surface is polished because, as the artist explained, quote, the point is to see yourself reflected in the names. The walls are aligned toward two other monuments, the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. The integration of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial with these other important structures acknowledges the significance of the Vietnam War to American history. Lynn intended the memorial as a tribute, and most visitors are moved upon experiencing it. Some veterans, however, saw it as part of a continued condemnation of the war. They said that rather than uplifting and instilling pride in the soldiers who fought, the monument's descent into the ground symbolized a moral criticism of both the war and its soldiers. The veterans also perceived the use of dark granite rather than white marble, more conventionally used for memorials, as a criticism. In response to these protests, a bronze sculpture of three soldiers, more traditional in style, was later placed a short distance from Lynn's wall. While the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers of New York's World Trade Center on September 11, 2001 is still considered one of the worst terrorist attacks in the history of the United States, some criticize the idea of making a monument at the site of the tragedy because the remains of many of the deceased are still buried underground, making it a sacred ground in the minds of some family members, and so people argued it might be inappropriate as a site for a monument that that would also have a gift shop, admission prices, tourists, and gawkers visiting all of the time. However, like the Vietnam Memorial, a competition was held to win the contract to build a memorial and museum to commemorate those who lost their lives on September 11th. After considering over 5,000 submissions, the design by Israeli-American Michael Arad and American landscape architect Peter Walker was chosen. Square footprints of the fallen towers framed in steel are now filled with waterfalls that represent the loss of so many lives. The edges of the squares are covered with bronze plaques inscribed with the names of 2,977 who were killed, including those on the hijacked flights on 9-11, those at the Pentagon, and the rescuers who tried to help people escape, as well as victims of the World Trade Center bombing in 1993. Every effort was made to align the names most accurately to the location closest to where they perished in the buildings, and the victims of the other sites were placed together. Located between and to the side of the tower waterfalls is the entrance to the 9-11 Memorial Museum, which is entirely underground. It contains artifacts from and information about the events of September 11th. The entryway is designed so that visitors experience the sadness of the event as they descend underground and are introduced to the personal lives of the victims. When visitors rise above the earth again and visit the sites of the towers, the sound and sight of the rushing waters and trees are meant to invite contemplation and promote healing. 